Well, good morning, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. And when I was invited to give these remarks, I really jumped at the chance uh, when I usually do the opposite. <laughs> but um, uh, it, it's just so, it's so great to be back in the space environment and with people who love uh, NASA and love our um, vision of our future in space. It's just a thrill to be here. I first visited NASA Goddard as a graduate student in the late 1970s when HEO-1 was launched. That's the uh, first of the high energy astrophysical observatories. <clears throat> and my advisor, <clears throat> excuse me, at Caltech was uh, a PI on the low energy detector on that satellite. And so he sent me to Goddard to uh, see how mission control operated. <clears throat> and it was a very useful experience for a few months later when uh, uh, of a class of stars that I was working on for my PhD thesis, one uh, went into visual outburst. It's a close binary system. And so I was able to work with my advisor to get Goddard to turn the spacecraft uh, towards that object while it was still in outburst and do observations of it. That's the first time that has been able to happen, and we la used the last bit of the proportional counter gas to observe that object, and uh, that turned out to be the first detection of uh, soft X-ray pulsations uh, from a cataclysmic variable binary star. So, so great fun, have great, great memories of my earliest times at Goddard, and then of course when I was NASA chief scientist doing doing much with Goddard, including um, almost the moment that I came in, and I'll talk about this a little more at the upcoming um, celebration of the Hubble Space Telescope, but uh, the first servicing mission was about to ensue when I came in the door as NASA's chief scientist, and that was also, uh, you can imagine, just a very, very heady period. So this symposium, of course, honors the vision of Robert Goddard, and I will uh, return to uh, Dr. Goddard towards the end of my remarks and say a little bit about his background and how it connects still with, uh, with all of us. In a few months, we're going to mark at NSF the 70th anniversary of the report of another visionary leader, Van Ivar Bush, commissioned by President Franklin Roosevelt, and that report, of course, was entitled Science, the Endless Frontier. This report envisioned how government could promote science and engineering research and education for greater social good and formed the base for what became, five years later, the National Science Foundation. This anniversary is a good reminder of the excitement 70 years ago about the benefits science and engineering could bring. And it gives us an opportunity to recapture the excitement as we consider the endless frontier in front of us. Both NASA and NSF are focused on scientific discovery and progress. And our agencies have a history of collaborative work that has propelled us in new directions. There are a number of important examples that illustrate how NSF and NASA funded research complement one another and join to advance the progress of science, which is NSF's mission. Sometimes it's uh, through synergy, sometimes through leverage, and sometimes through unanticipated discoveries that motivate new missions, new studies, and new collaborations. NSF and NASA could be said to be a complex adaptive system rather than merely additive partners. Ground-based and space-based observations are mutually reinforcing and conjoined to advance knowledge. A wonderful example is the NASA ground truthing, or I'm sorry, NSF ground truthing of the salinity measures taken in the NASA Aquarius mission. Since water is the host of much life, learning what controls its distribution and composition in the largest reservoir on Earth, the ocean, is a fundamental question relevant to many branches of science. 
NASA's Aquarius mission measured global sea surface salinity by satellite. NASA's interest in ground truthing the satellite observations led to NASA-NSF collaboration during the SPURS experiment, which stands for Salinity Processes in the Upper Ocean Regional Study in 2012 and 13. NSF funded a project from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution that looked at how mixing with denser waters affects surface salinity measured by the satellite. This project used new technology for measuring turbulence level, levels from autonomous gliders. And I got an opportunity to see those gliders and much of what we're doing in the ocean to support NASA missions when I traveled to Woods Hole frequently, uh, recently. NSF also funded one of the three ship cruises to the study area. The photograph shows a Woods Hole glider being lowered into the water with the micro rider turbulence instrument mounted piggyback on it. A second experiment called SPURS-2 is being planned for 2016-17. Part of the study includes an NSF funded project to focus on the shallow, shallow puddles of low salinity that occur on the surface after rain events. And now we want to turn to two examples of our unique partnership, that's NSF and NASA, that are both related to the question, is there life beyond Earth? This question was once in the realm of science fiction, but today there is scientific progress in addressing it through observations. My first example, one way to address this question is through planetary exploration, including research focused on our own planet Earth. As we explore the conditions that may support life forms on other planets, we turn to examine our planet and the extreme conditions in which life forms exist. Scientists funded by NSF have discovered life forms in very different extreme environments on Earth. One discovery is that bacteria may thrive in Lake Bostock, which is a suspected lake thousands of meters below the Antarctic ice sheet. Lake Bostock may be an analog to Europa, a frozen moon of Jupiter. At the other extreme, scientists have also found new life forms in hydrothermal vents at great depths in the ocean and microbes living inside rocks in extremely hot and highly acidic environment of the Yellowstone geysers. Finding extremophiles on Earth, that is creatures that can live in very inhospitable environments, gives us fuel to uh, do in situ planetary exploration. Why shouldn't we send satellites to take close up photos of potential sites for life and perhaps land on these sites and collect data? This is the idea behind a number of Mars missions and planned NASA missions such as the proposed Europa mission. Although the intellectual heritage for the Europa mission derives from previous NASA planetary missions like Pioneer 10, the Voyager spacecraft, and Galileo, NSF's funding of extremophile research and infrared spectroscopy from the ground complements the research garnered from spacecraft searching the solar system for clues to its formation, as well as clues about life on our planet and its possibilities elsewhere. My second example, the attempt to detect life beyond Earth has moved some scientists to look further than our solar system to identify possible Earths or orbiting distant suns. Since the mid-1980s, NSF has made over 100 awards in the field of extrasolar planetary detection. That effort has spawned a new breed of explorer, the planetary hunter. Nearly three decades, decades ago, planetary hunter Jeff Marcy received an NSF grant specifically designed to support research of faculty who are in predominantly undergraduate institutions, as he was at the time. His goal, to search for planets around other stars using the untested method of precise Doppler measurements. 
Marcy and his colleagues were the first to find evidence for a rocky planet around an M dwarf star called Gliese 876. The slide shows an artist's rendering of the planet. Planet hunting continued, and we learned that extrasolar planets were common. This knowledge provided a compelling reason to fly Kepler. Such discoveries are relatively new in our lifetime, but since the launch of NASA's Kepler satellite in 2009, the number of planets detected around other stars has increased exponentially to thousands of candidates. A few are thought to be rocky planets that orbit within habitable zones around their suns. Astronomers now believe our galaxy contains as many planets as it does stars, namely hundreds of billions of exoplanets. Both NSF and NASA will follow up on these initial discoveries with big glass on planet Earth. Existing and future large telescopes with adaptive optics and other technologies to image planets orbiting near their suns and newer spacecraft like TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite with the current launch goal of 2017. What's on the cusp? NSF and NASA have recently reached an agreement for a collaborative exoplanet research program called NN Explore. For this program, NASA will fund the construction of the Extreme Precision Doppler Spectrograph which will be installed on the Wind Telescope in Arizona, shown in the slide. And the 40% share of that telescope funded by NSF will be dedicated to exoplanet research programs. The program's goal is to find exoplanets with the mass of our planet Earth. NN Explore will make mass measurements of candidates that will be discovered by TESS and identify key targets for follow-up exoplanet spectroscopy with the James Webb Space Telescope. In drawing to close, I want to mention how the experience uh, the past year as NSF director has helped me appreciate from a new perspective how collaboration in research advances the progress of science. Before coming in as director, I was familiar with NSF from serving on the National Science Board for six years. And I was a principal investigator for the advance grant when I was at Purdue University. Directing NSF has given me firsthand experience of the impressive discovery research across a broad scale that characterizes NSF. Robert Goddard wrote, quote, it has often proved true that the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. Those are inspiring words. It's exciting to see the breadth and to experience why and how discovery research is so exciting and holds so much promise. Speaking with biologists one day and engineers the next, or likely on the same day, has solidified my appreciation of research in all the disciplines, and especially how cross-disciplinary research influences and interagency collaborations advance science. One of my aims as NSF director is to communicate the outstanding achievements more broadly so that people understand the value of these achievements and can better appreciate how they relate to their interest. So as we remember and celebrate Robert Goddard, physicist, engineer, inventor, and educator, we like to think that he shares our NSF DNA. We should remember, too, that the reception of innovation is seldom smooth. It is reported that Goddard's interest in space exploration was sparked by reading science fiction. During his career, he endured withering criticism for his visionary work. We could look back at the projects I've mentioned in my talk and find skepticism about them in their early stages. But the ideas have proven themselves to be more than viable. 
Goddard responded to the criticisms against him by stating that, quote, every vision is a joke until someone accomplishes it. Once realized, it becomes commonplace. We can take inspiration from Goddard's genius, but especially from his perseverance. It is crucial for scientists to keep seeking, to keep exploring, and NSF looks forward to continued exploration with NASA. Thank you. as probably the, the leader in, as we were talking earlier during his STEM education and then also with your experience at uh, three major leadership at three major um, universities uh, how, do, how in addition to um, NSF and NASA funding research um, what can the two agencies the foundation and, and NASA do to encourage folks at the universities to stay with the difficult course of study in science and math and technology. What can the agency also, and what can aerospace companies do to continue, in addition to funding them, what can they do to make, uh, to, to continue to motivate young people to stay with those difficult fields? Mm -hmm. Well, um, f first of all, I'd I personally don't think those fields are any more difficult than any other fields. I mean, try to become the great American writer, right? Or write something profound in economics or sociology. I mean, ev every field takes a, a vision and a commitment, and that's where it starts. And, and I, I think what um, NASA and NS NSF have been very good at, um, but can always improve, is setting out that vision, and the, it's the vision that inspires. It's the vision that probably changed uh, everybody's lives, uh, in, everybody in this room at some point, that they connected with that, and that drove them uh, through you know, difficulties and challenges. I, I think in uh, Antoine Saint-Exupéry said in, in The Little Prince that when you want to get people to build a ship, don't give them a you know, bunch of lumber and nails and stuff, but teach them to long for the infinite expanse of the ocean, and then they will figure out that they need a ship and find the stuff to build it with. So those are, that's uh, the way I look at that. But we do need to uh, better understand the obstacles that we put in people's way in going on their pathways. So for myself, um, just as a little background, I was an English major who did cultural anthropology when I was in, an undergraduate and didn't turn to physics until graduate school. And so um, I, I think that, that uh, pathways are not always uh, smooth and welcoming for uh, all sorts of people. It's not, not just women and underrepresented minorities, both of which I am, but, uh, but young men in poor socioeconomic areas. I mean, how, do, how does everybody get access to this to the vision, and that's where we can do, uh, for NSF, we really focus on research. We don't have all the money in the world. Our budget is seven and a half billion dollars, roughly, and uh, a little over one billion goes for our educational and STEM education mission. We focus on educational research that can then inform projects that uh, universities and, and centers, national labs, can then uh, do. But e each one of us has a role to play in both inspiring and in doing programs that are welcoming, that provide access. And sometimes those are summer programs, after school programs. It's, it's very hard to predict where a person's inspiration can come from. And so we have to have a lot of opportunities in a lot of different pathways. Other questions? Yeah, Matt here. Thank you. It was a great, great connection between NASA and NSF, so thank you. So you, you referred back to this famous document, you know, Science is the Endless Frontier, but that was in the fifth, that was way back. Are we in need of reinvigorating that vision now with, you know, 
this shift to applied, you know, uh, you know, with new with global warming. I mean, uh, how do we excite people again? I mean, I think you know things like the search for life is cross cutting, mm -hmm. but is there a need for a new vision to remind us what this endless frontier is like, or do we always have to go back to these older documents? Is there, how do we make this into the 21st century challenge of today? Well, uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, I think everybody knows Matt Mountain, and that's why you have the job you do, because you do think like that, and you do ask those kinds of questions. So uh, good, for, good for that. Um, yeah, I uh, have actually challenged the National Science Board to do just that. Um, and I've given a talk I, to the, scientific, the Council of Scientific Society Presidents in December um, about the particulars, actually, of the report and um, dissecting it into what still remains today and what is harder to connect with because times have changed. And remember, I referred to the NASA-NSF partnership as a complex adaptive system, which, which I did very pointedly because having been a member of the Santa Fe Institute, which, whose whole theme focuses on complex adaptive systems in all sorts of realms, and talking with them about this partnership specifically, and if one can view it that way. The reason why I like that is because, because of the adaptive quality. And yes, we can adapt, and yes, this is a new time. And you are right to imply that not everything about that time, which was in 1945, is similar to today. Uh, historians like to point out that, that that was a time unique in the history of science that everybody grouped together in the aftermath of World War II and in the success of involving scientists and engineers in winning that war and what that meant for the country going forward. And everyone was united in that, although they were divided if you read the history on particular details, but that's not relevant. Um, and, but we, we are not there. In fact, we are more divided in some sense than we are united in, in a vision. And I, I think there, there is a, um, a common basis in that people believe that science and engineering is valuable. They don't quite connect it to everything we use all day long, whether it's um, in uh, health or uh, the economy or personal communication or transportation devices and so on. Uh, that, and so we have many opportunities to connect. We, we do have an opportunity. I'm not quite sure who will rewrite science, the endless frontier. Now, the AAAS, of course, much to its credit, has come out with a very powerful report in the fall called um, Re Restoring the Foundation, and that has very many valuable insights, and especially where the U.S. has slipped in its investment uh, in R&D compared to GDP slipped to 10th place, and how other countries now, we've been a great model, we've taken in all the students, I've seen them sitting in our seats. Our head of engineering, uh, directorate at NSF, is asking the question, who's gonna be sitting in them 10 years from now, 20 years from now? The other countries go as they're going, and we have fewer graduate students from other countries who have provided so much to us. We're in a competitive world, period, and we, um, so I, I think it's a really good question that you ask, and we, we all need to be part of rewriting that because we need to reconnect and propel the vision forward. So.